All right, we are back here talking New York Giants football as they get ready for the draft in a couple of weeks. Join me today, good friend of the podcast. He covers the Giants for the Star Ledger. Daryl Slater is back. Daryl, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Not a problem, man. I feel like it's an eventful offseason of the Giants. What a big change. And starts way back beginning when they hire Joe Shane and Brian Dable from Buffalo to take over as GM and head coach. What do you think about the process here and, and where the Giants end up with their new uh, front office coach power structure? I don't think you can fault the process necessarily. I mean, they've looked outside of their organization, something they hadn't done in a while in terms of the GM hire. You know, they hadn't hired an outside GM since George Young, um, which was before I was born. And, and, and so, yeah, I mean, you can't fault the process. They were thorough. Um, I think the hires were kind of, you know, maybe what you'd expect, I guess, if you looked at the favorites for those jobs and how they were going to fit into the Giants' needs in terms of finding an offensive-minded coach to help Daniel Jones and fix this offense. But, um, you know, I, I think looking back on it, maybe, you know, if these hires don't work out, people could say, hey, they weren't the right hires. But in terms of the process that the Giants went through, I think it was a good change of pace for an organization that has looked uh, inward for far too long. And so um, we'll see how it all works out, though, because these guys have a big challenge in front of them. Yeah, I also think it's interesting seeing what Brian Dable has planned for Daniel Jones. I remember the press conference when he was hired. John Mara said, I failed Daniel Jones. I haven't given him enough consistency. He's had, at least now, four offensive coordinators in four years. He really didn't have much overall success. He's a rookie under Pat Shermer. And and Dable was pretty bullish on Daniel Jones. I can get a lot out of him. And he has the track record after helping build Josh Allen up in Buffalo. So what did you think about what Dable had to say about how he has plans to make Daniel Jones like much better? We'll see. I mean, he hasn't really revealed much specifically um, on that front, but, um, you know, that's probably what you'd expect for a couple of reasons. You know, obviously he doesn't want to tip his hand, number one. And number two, that, you know, since we had talked to Brian Dable last, I mean, it was, um, you know, really just the first day last week of, of off-season workout. So he hasn't really gotten a chance to get his hands on him too much on Daniel Jones. And, uh, obviously he's going to do things to try to uh, cater to his strengths. And, you know, there are still – some pretty significant limitations with this Giants offense. So, you know, we'll see if their playmakers can stay healthy, but their line, even if it does stay healthy, is not exactly a, a sterling group. That could be a problem, I think, for Daniel Jones. And yeah, he has to learn another, another new offense. Maybe this is a quarterback-friendly offense, but it's more change for him um, in terms of learning another another new offense. And and the, and the reality remains. I mean, it might just be the fact that Daniel Jones isn't, isn't that good. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think that's possible. Um, so it's, it's one of those deals where maybe nobody could fix him in terms of making him an elite quarterback. So, uh, I think that's possible, but, uh, we'll see, you know, obviously I, I would expect him to decline the fifth year option by the May 2nd deadline. Uh, and that would mean Daniel Jones has got a last chance audition here in 2022 to show the Giants he can be a legit starter in the NFL. Yeah, I feel like it's a win-win for all parties involved here because Jones has a chance to play in a better system. If he's great, the Giants either tag him or... He can test the market if he's not good. And the Giants will truly be in the market for quarterback next year. So I don't think anybody really loses here. Right. No, exactly. I mean, even if they decline the option, it doesn't mean, like you said, that, that he's gone. Um, if he plays well, they have the ability to tag him, I think, at about $30 million as opposed to, you know, locking in the $21 million option right now because it's fully guaranteed. So that, that's the rub of the option now. It's the new CBA. It's fully guaranteed at the time you exercise it. And so you'll see, I think, more and more of these options get declined just because of the nature of it being fully guaranteed. You don't want to get into a situation like say the Panthers did. They, they, they exercised the option on Sam Darnold. They almost had to after trading what they traded for him. And it looks like a terrible decision because <laughs> they're locked in on a guy who isn't very good. And so, um, yeah, you have the ability to, uh, with Daniel Jones, if he thrives after presumably declining the option, you could tag him or, or extend him. Um, granted you'd be doing those things, uh, based on just one year of success. Now, I mean, I suppose it's possible he goes out and really lights it up, but uh, who knows? I, I, you know, if I had to forecast the most likely situation, I say he probably has an average to below average year. Uh, he moves on, and the Giants draft a quarterback next year. Yeah, it makes some sense. And speaking of the free agency situation here, everybody knew going in the offseason the Giants are not going to be doing too much because they didn't have a lot of cap room. They had to do a lot of restructuring just to get under the cap ahead of the free agency period. But I think for what they the hand they got, they thought they did too badly. What do you think about the Giants did in free agency? Yeah, I mean, it, it, Joe Shane was always going to be very limited by the fact that Dave Gettleman left him in you know, salary cap hell and uh, by not only handing out big contracts, some of which are, you know, okay, I guess, Leonard Williams and some of which have been terrible and Kenny Galladay, and then he restructured contracts and uh, it's just a bad situation for the Giants and it's going to be hard for Joe Shane to dig out for that 
from that. I mean, it's going to take a, a year plus here to do that. And so obviously they had to prioritize. And so they, they went volume and they went, um, we were kind of like lower tier guys, which is what you expect. And, um, but offensively, I mean, it's hard to, they did upgrade it at right guard. You know, obviously Will Hernandez, low bar there. They signed Mark Lewinsky from, from the Colts. And I think that's an upgrade, um, you know, center. They didn't really have a center because Nick Gates is, you know, had that horrible leg injury. And so they bring in John Feliciano. And I think that's still a big question mark there from the bills, obviously system familiarity, but in terms of him, him being an effective player, who knows? They have to really figure out the rest of this offensive line here. Like, who plays left guard? Uh, what do they do at right tackle? And so those those are problems. I mean, obviously, the, you let Evan Ingram walk, which is not a surprise. And uh, Ricky Steele-Jones, an upgrade? You know, probably not. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to see a way in this which this team is markedly better after free agency, which is what you'd expect, though. I mean, because of the way that they were so limited with cap. But, but this draft looms large because they do have a lot of draft capital. Yeah, I think the move I think I like the most that they did was bring in Tyrod Taylor to be the backup. We saw the yeah. fall-off they had last year when Daniel Jones got hurt and Mike Glenn had to start, and they really could not move the football at all. And there were games where they would just run the ball uh, 30, like 30, uh, 35 plays. They didn't trust the offense that moved the ball. Tyrod Taylor is a competent NFL quarterback. Yeah, I mean, there was some talk about them bringing in Mitch Trubisky, and um, obviously you're seeing what's happening in Pittsburgh where, like, yeah, he was the starter, kind of, sort of, but then they're going to probably draft somebody over him or he'll just get, like, one year to prove himself. But I think there was some thought, you know, obviously that they, the Giants could bring him in because he was in Buffalo last season with Brian Dable, um, but that didn't happen. And so Taylor is not a guy who you look at and say, wow, he could win the job and in a true competition this summer and he could be – uh, you know, their starter going forward. That's not who he is at this point in his career. He's a very capable backup who can keep the season afloat if something happens with Daniel Jones. But it, look, if something, you know, Taylor being, you know, he turns 33 in August. So uh, if, if if something does happen with Daniel Jones and Tyra Taylor steps in and starts, I mean, that means both of those guys are probably gone next year or Taylor's the backup again behind a draft pick. So, um, yeah, it's more of a safety net uh, for a team that, Let's be honest. I mean, they're probably not going to win many games. So it's a difference between, uh, you know, maybe you win six games, seven games with Daniel Jones as your quarterback, or if Jones gets hurt, you can put Taylor in. Or, you know, if the wheels fall off and you were starting a Mike Lennon-level guy, you're winning three or four games. And quite frankly, if, if that's the case, if you're going to win six games, you know, you might as well win three games if you're going to be drafting <laughs> a quarterback high next year. That that saves you from having to trade up for a quarterback. But we're a long way away from that, obviously, and teams don't think like that. but. Um, but yeah, I think the Taylor signing is a, is a good one to, to give them some confidence if Jones is unable once again to stay healthy. Yeah, I also want to talk about how Joe Shane handled that giant cap situation because I remember going in the office looking at some of the cap numbers on over the cap and stuff like that. And I was saying, okay, oh, you know, maybe Blake Martinez is a candidate to get cut off the knee injury. Sterling Shepard's always a hurt. He's done a lot of restructuring. Guys are taking pay cuts to stay. There's still one big, like, rabbit hole out here at the James Bradbury thing. But I mean... You look at what he's done and some of the figures, looks like they have almost $95 million of cap room next year. I feel like he's done pretty good in cleaning up the mess this year. Yeah, I think that, you know, it was going to be a hard situation because everyone knew he was in that in that mess. And so, you know, you're not getting anything for Blake Martinez or Sterling Shepard in a trade coming off those injuries. So how, how do you handle it? You just straight up cut them and then you're definitely going to be worse, right? At those two, you know, especially middle linebacker and Martinez is definitely an important position. So, uh, you bring him back in like a ma- he got a major pay cut, and so um, that I think was a smart move because you know you you can't just slash and burn your entire team. Um, so they were able to have it both ways. And Martinez, because of, you know he got hurt in week three, he he probably could be available week one. Sterling Shepard, uh, you know it's hard to imagine him contributing much this season because he got hurt so late in the season and he tore his Achilles tendon. So that was a pretty significant late season injury. Um, and, and Kadarius Tony can play in the slot too, so it's he's, he's a little bit redundant anyway. Um, but yeah, I think that he threaded the needle nicely. That the, the James Bradbury thing—I mean, a twenty-one million dollar cap hit and, and cutting him or, or or trading him would free up ten million in cap savings. And I, they obviously want to do that. I mean, he's made it very clear that they want to trade James Bradbury, and it just becomes. He's a good player, so you don't want to like cut him and get nothing for him. But the problem is, you know, the salary is thirteen point four million. And he's going into the final year of his contract, so that that's a mitigate. Those are mitigating factors of what you can get for a guy. So 
Yeah, they would love to have traded him like two weeks ago if they were able to get value for him. But that, that's the problem right now. I mean, what can you get for James Bradbury at this point when everyone, number one, knows you want to trade him? And number two, you know, he's got this big cap, uh, cap hit in terms of salary at 13.4 going into, you know, with the final year of his contract. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a big problem they do have because you know that right now they have about six million, six point seven million cash space right now. You need about like thirteen to pay all the picks they have. So everybody in the league knows that Bradbury can still play and that the Giants have to move on from one way or another. So a lot of teams are saying, you know, like why am I trading a pick to get him at his number where I can, I can just wait the Giants out, make them cut him, or make them keep some of that salary, make it better for me to take on the contract. Exactly. And then if you're Joe Shane, it's like why do I want to take on the salary? some of the salary and, and lower my cap savings while not getting that good of a pick. So it's, he sort of has to weigh all of those factors. Yeah. So how do you think it's resolved? Is he up just getting cut before the draft or something like that? Yeah, I could see that. I could definitely see him getting cut. Um, at this point, I suppose they could, they could, they could make that a, uh, a post June cut. So if they make it a post June cut, well, if they make it a post June one cut, that would mean 11 and a half in cap savings. Um, versus 10.1 on a pre-June one cut. So it's not really that big of a difference. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was a pretty good signing by Dave Gettleman. I mean, James Bradbury has been pretty good. Um, the problem is, you know, the number is just so high um, and the team is not in a position now where they, they're they in, they're not in a win-now position and, and he's not going to be with them past this year, I wouldn't think. Um, so it's tough. Um, it's a tough situation that they're in. Um but I think it's entirely possible that you could see him get cut because they just don't have the cap space right now to operate. I mean, it's, at this point, I think the number is twelve and a half million dollars in cap space that they have to allocate for their twenty twenty two draft picks. Um, the way they could kind of lessen that is, well, the way they definitely could lessen that is by trading back in the first round, which you know is generally even if you're not in this type of situation, it can be a smart move for a rebuilding team because um, you know pick up a pick up a first round pick next year and potentially use that as ammo to trade up for a quarterback and you need to do that next year. And at the same time, uh, lower your cap number for what you have to pay your draft pick this year because you're moving back in the first round. Yeah. And this, this year, they, the one part of the Gelman left for the giants was that extra first round pick from the bears, which ended up becoming a number seven because the bears had a rough year. So they're sitting here, obviously they are I think everybody in the league knows they can pick a tackle with one of those picks. So like who are some guys the giants could target around one if they happen to stay put at five and seven. Yeah, I think, so if you look at that, they're in a great position, like I said, um, draft-wise. If you look at the tanks on draft power rankings, they're, they're number three in that behind the Jets and the Texans. So they have three, they have um, five, seven, 36, 67, and 81, even if you go down to 112. So they have, if you if you go down to 81, they have five fairly premium picks and, you know, led, of course, by five and seven. But I think if you're looking at tackles, um, you're looking at Iki Okonwu, the kid from NC State, obviously, and then Alabama, Evan Neal, Charles Cross, the guy from Mississippi State. So those would be the three main guys you could potentially draft to play right tackle opposite Andrew Thomas, who's been, you know, pretty good. I mean, he looked like a bad draft pick at first. Now, I mean, Dave Gettleman did some did some some good things. I mean, it's not like he did every single thing bad. Um, but we'll see if the Andrew Thomas pick could continue to look better and better. Um, and uh, they do need a right tackle, obviously, because Matt Parrott. Uh, Third round pick a couple of years ago has been bad. Um, so Ekonwu, Cross, Neal, those would be the three guys you're looking at if you're talking tackles. Um, and I would think, you know, there's no way um, all three of those guys are going to fall to seven. And, um, you know, you could see a situation where one or more of them are gone before five. Yeah, I think in, in terms of like whether Aries, they, they could, could they be able to look forward to address in the draft. And I think obviously if they happen to stay put, I think corner would be an option they could look at here. They end up moving on from Bradbury. They take the year to uh, on guard from Cincinnati or uh, Stingley from LSU. Those would be the guys. Yeah. Stingley from LSU, Gardner from Cincinnati. And the issue with Stingley and like he said, that's of course, like you said, um, dependent on what they do, uh, what they do with Bradbury. If he's gone and I would think he is gone. Uh, so then in that case, you need, a, you need, if you move a Dory Jackson to your number one corner, which is, which is fine, I guess, because right? he did have a better year last year than um, Bradbury, albeit while playing against, you know, lesser receivers. Um, but you still would need to have a, uh, need to have someone to play opposite in the corner. So then what do you do? Um, Gardner, Stingley are the options. I think if you, Stingley is a big time boomer bust guy because he's had injury issues. 
Um, and so that's where people are looking at him and saying, ah, you know, I don't know. Um, and, and so maybe Gardner a little bit more of a, of a, of a safer pick there. Um, the other guy who's a, considered a high first round corner is, is Trent McDuffie from uh, Washington, but he's, he's a little on the smaller side at five eleven. you know, he's, he's eighth on the PFF big board. He's actually one spot ahead of Gardner on that, but I, I, I don't know if a lot of people have it in that order. Um, but yes, yeah, Stingley's a, a fascinating prospect. Um, but this, if you look at PFF and the way they, they run their, they have their big board. I mean, the top, uh, nine guys, I mean, you have, um, it's pretty, it's pretty corner and, and tackle heavy. I mean, you have Stingley in there, uh, Ch- Charles Cross, Akanwu, Evan Neal, uh, Trent McDuffie and Gardner. So those guys are all in, all in the top nine. So, um, it, it's a, it's a good opportunity for the Giants who have needed those spots to be able to fill them and even edge rusher. Hutchinson's not going to be there, of course, but, but what about Kayvon Thibodeau? Is he there at, is he there at five? the kid from Oregon. So um, he's another elite prospect to keep an eye on. So it's a good year to have those needs where the Giants have those needs. Now, granted, they have a lot of needs, but but those are three of them. Edge rusher, tackle, and uh, probably corner when they move on from Bradbury. Yeah, I know, obviously, that Joe Shane is kind of, is very hinted, very publicly, he would love to trade back and get an extra one for next year. A lot of people are looking at number seven as well as a spot to do that. Like, I honestly think that number five might be a better play because – I think obviously the best way to get a team to trade into the top top ten is they're looking for a quarterback. And you have Carolina sitting there at six, who made no secret they're looking to get a long term quarterback. Like I would think the chain could probably get more if he's shopping five, saying, "Hey, if you want your guy, you got to jump ahead of Carolina to get him." It's not a great quarterback year, so you'd think that the team, you know, quarterback needy teams would want to get the top quarterback, whoever that guy is, whether it's Malik Willis or Kenny Pickett. Those look like the two guys right now, like you said. So Carolina at six. And Atlanta at eight are the are the two quarterback needing teams, and of course the Giants are. Uh, I mean, it doesn't look like the Texans will pick a quarterback at three, so the Giants are sitting there at five and seven. So they're right in front of Carolina, right in front of Atlanta. Um, so the, I would say, yeah, five is probably the spot you want to move back from. Um, now, who would you who are you doing the deal with? And then it becomes like, yeah, you've seen the Saints um, make these moves to try to move up. Uh, obviously, the B move with the Eagles trade to try to move up and potentially get in position to draft a quarterback. But the problem with that is that the Saints uh, do not have a first-round pick next year. They traded that to, to the to the Eagles in, in order to, to move up in this draft. So if, if you're Joe Shane, you say, oh, well, I want an extra first-round pick next year in case I have to use that as package, that as ammo um, to move up for a quarterback. Well, you're not going to get that from the Saints. But you could get a, you could get a 2024 first-round pick and, 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 you know, use that to move up next year if you have to move up for a quarterback, if that makes sense. So it all depends on what the team hypothetically would be trading with next year would want. Um, But yeah, the Saints are a team to watch for sure, because obviously they have a quarterback issue and obviously they, they are, they have been making these moves to try to, uh, to try to get in position to likely, right. Move up for a quarterback. They're at 16 and 19 right now. Um, And, and maybe that move would be to five, the next one. Yeah, my last question is this. Obviously, we've heard all the rumors about them trading here. What are the odds you think they're actually stay put and make both picks at five and seven? I think it's. I think they. I think it's decent because you know, look, it's not a great quarterback class. I mean, usually what drives these trade up moves and desperation, uh, you know, you see whether it was Mitch, Mitch, uh, uh, Trubisky was considered a good prospect, right? Same as Sam Darnold, but the 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 uh, Jets and uh, well, the Bears, obviously, with Trubisky, and then the Jets with, with Darnold. Did these trade up moves because they, you know, they they paid a premium to move up for a quarterback. Obviously, neither situation worked out. Uh, but but I think people are looking at this class, and um, it's it's not even like at the time. You know, you could say, oh, there's a great quarterback, right? At the time, everyone thought oh, Darnold's a good player, really good player. At the time, Trubisky, a really good player, uh, didn't turn out that way. Now it could go the other way, where people are saying, you know, Willis, Pickett, who knows? They don't look like great prospects, and they both turn out to be great. Who knows? But there the perception right now is that, and all, you know, look, all it takes is one team to fall in love with a quarterback, but it doesn't seem like um, the quarterbacks are driving that kind of interest this year. Um, and then again, like I said, if you look at the teams lower, I mean, maybe Washington would have been a team to move up if they hadn't made the deal for Carson Wentz. They're at 11. Like, they could have made the move to five, um, but that, that's not happening now. They have Wentz. Um, if, if say, you know, the Vikings had moved on from Kirk Cousins, they're at 12. Nope not happening there because you know they're they have cousins um obviously back in the fold so 
the Eagles won't be moving up because they moved back. I mean, they're, they're committed, it seems, to Jalen Hurts. And uh, like the Saints would be the one. But there's not a lot of teams that are down there that are going to be trying to jump. Um, right, Green Bay at 22. Um, nope, Aaron Rodgers is back, of course. So there aren't a lot of candidates. And then you, that you have two quarterback needy teams at 6 and 8. Now, would Atlanta try to jump Carolina and move from 8 to 5? Maybe. Um, but what are you getting in that type of three spot move? If you're the giants, like, are you getting a, a ton of value in that trade back? So, uh, I, I think they wind up staying at five and seven and making the picks. All right, Darren. Thanks for all the time. I really appreciate it. Before I let you go, have you, yeah. have, have you followed social media? Keep up with your coverage for the giants. Yeah, well, it's nj.com slash giants. I you know, cover the giants with Zach Rosenblatt. We, you know, who does a great job. And, um, on Twitter at Daryl Slater, D A R R Y L S L A T E R. And uh, appreciate you having me on. Appreciate people reading. Absolutely, Darren. Thanks all the time. I really appreciate it. No problem.